Today I'm extraordinarily delighted to welcome and uh, introduce Sir David Cox as our speaker. And when uh, we st first started planning the Summer Institute for Computational Social Science, um, we were really keen to bring a statistician's perspective uh, amongst our uh, list of speakers. And in particular, we were, we were very, we found that there was essentially, it was really important that we would have someone who would talk about not just sort of the potential of big data and, and the proliferation of data sources for, for social science research, but also to talk about some of the, the limitations and, and, uh, and, and provide a sort of salient critique of it. So then I thought, well, who better to do this than to have one of the world's most prominent statisticians, Sir David Cox, come and talk to us about um, how we should think of statistical analysis in a world of big data. Um, perhaps Sir David is, is familiar to, to most of you already, uh, but at least I, I guess his biggest claim to fame is perhaps uh, the proportional hazards model, which he published in his 1972 paper, which is one of the most, uh, 100 most cited papers of all time. And there are just many other fields of statistics that Sir David has contributed to. Um, and he's worked not just in academia, but he's also worked in government-funded research organizations. So, so he has a, a, a vast experience that spans both, in a sense, um, industry and research organizations as well as uh, working in academia. Um, so David has, of course, had a number of very important uh, fellowships, and he's served as the president of a number of prestigious uh, academic, academic organizations, professional organizations, such as the Bernoulli Society, the Royal Statistical Society, and the International Statistics Institute. Um, and in 2010, he received the, Cop the Copley Medal, the Royal Society's highest award. Um, and in 2016, the International Prize in Statistics. So he's had a number of accolades, too many for me to list in this very short introduction. So all I have to do now is to introduce, is to welcome him and uh, thank him again for coming to come uh, to coming to talk with talk with us today. Well, thank you very much indeed. Um, I'm going to talk about variability, and variability can mean various things. It can mean systematic variability. If we change this or make a policy alteration to that, what are the consequences? What, is, what are proper, very often the chain of consequences that will happen? These, these uh, need investigation and careful description. And then there's variability that is not predictable. And the most obvious is survival time. We have a group of homogeneous, in some sense, socially homogeneous individuals of a particular age and background and so forth, how long before they die. This is not a predictable variable. How can we describe the properties of such times? How can we study them? How can we say uh, what makes people survive a bit longer or a bit shorter and so forth? How can these things be thought about in a systematic way? And how can they be studied quantitatively uh, in a way that advances understanding and, and aids communication of our results? Now, I'm going to describe the techniques, that are, the ideas that are involved in doing that under a number of headings, which are not to be taken too seriously and not to be taken in the order. I mean, everything's to be taken seriously, obviously. <laughs> Uh, there, are no, there are no jokes in this lecture at all, <laughs> as yet. Um, the order is, a, is a, a planned one, but not to be taken too seriously, as I said. And the, the first idea would be that of formulating the research question uh, that you want to investigate. And doing that precisely enough uh, for it be fe feasible to study. Now, this may sound obvious, but but then <coughs> it's, it's a fact of life, in, indeed, that uh, people, even serious uh, experienced investigators, formulate 
their research questions, they can do so in a way that's not essentially answerable. You need to formulate it, your research questions uh, not too rigidly, but at least in a form that they are capable in principle of being answered by the data that you have or the data that you're likely to be able to obtain. So the formulation of questions uh, is a critical issue. And I'm not suggesting uh, this is a rigid thing done once and all at the beginning. The questions may evolve during the course of an investigation. And this incidentally applies as much in pure mathematics as in more empirical studies. Asking the right question, uh, a pure mathematician may do a beautiful piece of work resolving an issue of no conceivable interest to anybody, or they may do uh, something that's focused on something that has very strong consequences. So the choice of the research question is a critical one and, and it may need re uh, revi revision from time to time. And then closely associated that with that obviously is the issue of design. From one extreme, we have the design of uh, um, experiments, interventions in which the investigator has virtually total control over what's going on. Uh, the control is never total, of course, but, but may, may be very substantial. And the randomized clinical trial is uh, uh, an example of that, going, which has a long history from other fields, in particular from agriculture, and to some extent from physics, where, where carefully, very, very carefully and meticulously planned experiments are, are crucial. But some of the basic principles of the design of investigations uh, come out of agriculture. And in particular, one key question that I think will arise in many contexts is it a good idea for your current investigation to think of one sharply focused question and try and answer that? Or is it better to, to ask a battery of questions that are interrelated with one another? And the great statistician R.A. Fisher, who began his work in the 1920s in an agricultural context, although his name uh, is not often primarily thought of as a geneticist, um, he began in an agricultural context and set out in the mid-1920s the principles of experimental design under four headings. And one of them was the notion of asking nature uh, an interrelated series of questions. Now that's in an experimental or interventionist context. But the same principle does apply more, more generally if you're using observational data. Are you going to concentrate on your efforts on one sharply focused question? Or are you going to, <coughs> excuse me, are you going to try and study uh, an interrelated series of things? And then the third item in my list is what's called metrology. And that's a term used mainly by physicists to mean measurement. How do we measure things? Are our measurements measuring what we think they are? Uh, if not, what are we going to do about it? How accurate are they really? And the most obvious example of that in uh, context, I would guess that many of you are likely to be interested in, which I certainly am personally, is the issue of measuring quality of life. Uh, perhaps in a medical context, but not totally. The key issue there is, a key issue at least, is how multidimensional are you going to be? Are you going to say, we must have a single number that measures the quality of an individual's life, perceived or as it is at the moment, or how it might be in the future, so that we can make suggestions this is particularly in uh, perhaps a clinical context, but more broadly, so that suggestions and policies can be introduced that will, in some sense, maximize the quality of life. Um, but it's a difficult issue. 
how dimensional, how multidimensional is quality of life. Um, I'm being slightly unkind to economists, uh, not all economists, but some economists. Uh, but if, how can I put it? If, if your view of life is that it's a series of optimizations, optimization, to optimize something, the something has to be one dimensional. You can't say optimize two things at the same time because, in general at least, uh, they have to be collapsed into one. So uh, that forces the thinking about the quality of life to be that the quality of a person's life, as perceived now or maybe estimated for the future, is a single number, uh, so often expressed as a so-called quality, 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 quality adjusted life year on a scale from naught to four. Four means perfect life and so forth. Three means three quarters of a perfect life. And then having got a number like that, you, you can um, think about trying to opt, make rational choices about it. Um, the counter to that is to say uh, that quality of life is, is a multidimensional thing and try and measure it by uh, some elaborate questionnaire. There's a standard 50, 50 item questionnaire that attempts to, I think, separate the quality of life into four dimensions. Uh, and the snag of that, of course, is that you can, particularly if you're working with patients, uh, maybe they'll patiently fill out, sorry for the pun, maybe they'll fill out a 50 item questionnaire once, but you can't keep on doing that. Uh, whereas asking them a simple question may be repeatable. And an extreme of that is a study which I think took place in Oxford, but I might be wrong, of the quality of life of patients suffering from um, difficulties of walking. And the, uh, and the single question was, could you put your socks on today unaided, yes or no? And that gave, uh, I think they were suffering from rheumatoid arthritis. That gave, uh, in one zero binary observation, uh, an indication of the, the relevant aspect of the quality of this person's uh, life. And of course, that's a natural question to ask. And there's no likely to get a broadly truthful answer, which many of these self-assessed questionnaires, that's perhaps a bit doubtful, but likely to get a truthful answer and in principle repeatable. So that's uh, an example of metrology, uh, the principle of measuring things in a careful and appropriate way. And of course, many of the advantages, many of, many of the developments, particularly in the medical sciences, come from physics through the ability to measure in, through scanning devices of various kinds, uh, things of great subtlety, starting really with x-rays 100 years ago and developing from that, of measuring things that were previously uh, not measurable at all. So metrology, the ability to measure things in an appropriate and suitable way is a key item. Now, how am I off the... So I've talked about question formulation, crucial, design of your study, uh, whether it's experimental, interventionist, whether it's um, observational, or whether it's uh, collecting appropriate data that already exists and deciding which, if any, of the data that may be available is appropriate for your study. Then we can move on to that, to the various stages of analysis. And one could divide the, the analysis of the data into all sorts of phases, depending upon whether it's data that's already been fairly thoroughly analyzed from different points of view, and well understood, or whether it's the outcome of some totally new investigation in a field in which you have very little experience. 
in which case you have to proceed much more uh, uh, well, the multi-stage aspect uh, becomes much more relevant. The ideas that you, in, in collecting the data, if, if you collected the data or response or chose the data, you must have some idea of how you're going to analyze it when you made the choice of the data that you're going to look at. Uh, but to, to hold to that too rigidly can, can be dangerous. And then when the analysis is complete, what on earth does it all mean? What, 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 does, it, what does it suggest as the basis for action? Uh, what new studies should be set up? And so forth. And so if we go through those phases, uh, all of them, you might say, anything to do with statistics. Uh, they're subject matter. Of course, they're subject matter questions. But the point is that there are ideas and principles involved that span a large range of subjects, from the purest of physics uh, to uh, the most extreme of, of application in the social sciences and everyday life. That there are common features. And in a sense, the theoretical statistician's job, and I'm, I class myself as a theoretical statistician, although my training is in mathematics, my, I don't, I'm not talking about mathematics, I'm talking about theory. As a theoretical statistician, the object is to try and see some sort of unity of approach to all these problems, whatever their field, that will be helpful and constructive as well as getting involved in particular applications. So that's the broad theme of what I want to talk about. Now, uh, going on to analysis, the basic principles of analysis, uh, there's one overriding principle that always applies, and that's the first one on that slide. You keep things as simple as you possibly can, but no simpler. Uh, if there's a real difficulty there, it's got to be faced somehow. One aspect that one tends to think of as very much the statistician's province is the whole apparatus of significance tests, confidence intervals, posterior intervals, etc., etc. And, and there are, there's 200 years of discussion of. Uh, the, the quasi-philosophical basis of all this, and it's very interesting, and it's an important part of what, of what we do and, uh, and of what scientists do, uh, that, that these techniques, which are basically principles of analysis and interpretation, how secure is your interpretation of the analysis that you propose? How is that security to be expressed? There's endless discussion and misunderstanding about that, and it's an important thing of what we do. But a more important aspect, I think, in great many respects, is the fourth one I've got, the third one I've got down there, that we're concerned with the lucid description of complex relationships by regression equations and other, other techniques that will describe the systematic component of our variability in as an enlightening a way as possible. And enlightening means various things, <coughs> understandable, obviously, but also linking the data that you have with other data, with underlying theory, and so forth. And the depth and subtlety with which you can do that depends strongly on the field in which you're working and the nature of the data. And I've, there's an endless literature on this, but I'm referring in particular to a rather strange play, journal, uh, Diagnostic Histopathology, where uh, Christiana Kautsanake, who some of you may know, uh, works in Oxford, uh, has edited an international series of papers uh, on modern statistical developments. And in about 50 pages, four, I think it's less than 50 pages, uh, there's a very excellent summary of some of the main developments in statistical methodology uh, 
that uh, are common in a biomedical field, primary, biomedical context primarily, but certainly by, not, by no means only in that field. So I recommend Christiana's uh, work there. Now, I've spoken for how long? 15 minutes. I've managed to avoid saying big data. <laughs> Are you going to outlaw me? Regard me as... Uh... Yes seems to be the answer. <laughs> um, well, big data, the thing about big data is, that, of course, in a sense, big data have been around a long time. Um, but you couldn't analyse them. You might be able, to, uh, for example, if I could give a personal application from one of the first bits of work I was ever involved with, if you were interested in the thickness of a textile yarn that's being woven, uh, uh, textile yarn is produced in batches of, oh, each single production run up would be perhaps 50 kilometres of yarn. This can be measured every five millimetres for, let's say, thickness. No problem. You can produce paper trace of data of this sort endlessly. That's one batch of yarn, and then you have lots of others. Well, so what? You see, you can't. In those days, you could look at you could look at paper traces that showed these patterns of variability, or it might have been uh, stress on an aircraft in flight, which would produce somewhat similar sets of data. Um, you could look at it, but you could, the facilities to do any sort of numerical analysis uh, were totally absent. You could only take a sample. Uh, but, but it's not at all clear that uh, a sample doesn't tell you all that you really want to know. It's by no means clear that just because the data are big, that's necessarily a, a, an insightful thing. Does big data mean big amounts of information? Well, sometimes, no doubt, but certainly not always. And if, if, uh, if the answer is, well, no, not... Uh, the fact that it's big doesn't make it reliable or good. Uh, is a warning sign. So the key issue in many of these big data contexts is uh, the quality of the data. Plus, the, the question I put, when is enough enough? Uh, because uh, there's no particular virtue, there's no, perhaps no great harm, but if you take 10 or 100 times as much data as you really need, in practice you're likely to confuse yourself a bit. But, but in, perhaps it doesn't often matter. Then there's the more technical issue. If you have an enormous amount of data, most uh, measures of precision that you calculate from data that tell you how well you've done at estimating some feature that you're interested in, most of these decrease like one over the square root of this amount of data. Not all, but most do. And if you have an enormous amount of data, one over the square root of the enormous amount of the enormous number is something very, very, very small. So the apparent precision of your conclusions can be very high. But there are, I think, quite powerful reasons, and this is a largely unexplored theme, there are quite powerful reasons for thinking estimates of precision calculated from large amounts of data are often wild, often, well, perhaps almost always a bit over-optimistic, over and perhaps sometimes wildly over-optimistic. They ignore features of the big data uh, that, by assuming, uh, in a slightly more technical sense, independent random variables with a certain data, all that sort of stuff, uh, by assuming that, they get a one over the square root of sample size effect, and that's misleading. So the correct calculation of standard errors is, uh, I, I think, a, a largely open question. And 
to be tackled, of course, in the context of each particular case, and to, at least to begin with, although no doubt there are some general principles involved. Now, I haven't mentioned, or I've just used the term big data, I haven't t mentioned machine learning, uh, 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 data science, so on and so forth. Each day goes by, there seems to be a new branch uh, coming largely from the computer science literature, but not entirely, to some extent, from mathematical physics. Uh, there comes a new uh, theme, a new book, Informati Informatics, uh, for example. I have read a, just read a book about Infometrics. I must get it right. Um, and it, it's a new slant on uh, variability in data. And some of this, uh, uh, of course, uh, much of it is driven by uh, engineers coming to it from computer science background, and some of it is undoubtedly very interesting and important. I'm not being dismissive about it. I'm saying it has to somehow other fit into a broader picture that looks at uncertainty in the correct way and doesn't produce unstable and over-emphatic uh, conclusions. Now, I, say, I thought I'd say a very brief word about one example, a uh, situation where we have individuals who are interested in uh, how long they live. Now, this is a situation where there are going to be two sorts of variability present, and we can't really escape this. Uh, that there's going to be some systematic variability as between social class, uh, medical background, family background, genetics, and so forth. There's going to be some systematic variation which will need capturing and explaining as, as concisely and elegantly as we, uh, and insightfully as we can. Mm -hmm. But inevitably, there's going to be a large unexplained component and we've got to be able to describe that unexplained component by graphically, numerically, perhaps by formulae, um, and that leads into um, uh, various highly developed parts of statistical analysis connected, going back oh, into, the, into the 19th century, but certainly to the early work of actuaries Obviously, <coughs> obviously, actuaries have a particular interest in people's duration of life, um, but also from physics and biological sciences and so forth. Um, so we, ha we have to be able to describe the distribution of lifetime. We have to be able to describe what might influence it, it systematically, and but realise there'll be a large unexplained component left over. We've got to be able to describe that, summarise it in nice graphs or plots or summary statistics or whatever. And so that's, that's a relatively rich field that started in the actuarial science, sciences, um, both in physics and in engineering. My own background was just came from, in this case, interest in problems in engineering. Now, <coughs> being a bit more detail, many of these investigations that I've talked about um, are essentially come down to saying, how does this depend upon that? But the pattern of dependence, of course, may be quite subtle and complicated, but that's what it's going to come down to. And I've listed there uh, three levels at which this problem can be studied. And the first is that of the textbook study of regression in some form, including logistic regression and survival regression and so on and so forth. But how does one variable depend upon a modest number of individual observations uh, with a modest number of individuals to study. I'm not going to say what modesty is, 
uh, but, but uh, that's, uh, you know what I mean, not so enormously large that we can't look, absorb the, the data as a whole. And that's really essentially studied in statistical textbooks under the heading of regression and logistic regression and survival regression and so on and so forth. How does this depend upon that? Um, I put with caution because, of course, it's always uh, easy to overinterpret any dependencies that you find. Then the next step, which started to get prominence perhaps 40 or 50 years ago, um, was when we have essentially the same situation, but we've got rather large numbers. Not the large numbers we might talk about today, but large numbers by the computational uh, facilities that were available at the time. So uh, 30 explanatory variables, 500 individuals, and things of this sort. Multiple regression techniques are still available, but there's then the issue uh, that we don't want to end up, uh, or typically don't want to end up with uh, an, an equation that describes uh, uh, an outcome that we're interested in with 30 things on the, on the other side of the equation. We can't really, it's not an aid. It may be an aid to prediction in some context, but it's not an aid to understanding. So we have to try and simplify that. And there were various techniques of the time of which um, bridge regression was one of the most popular, in which you essentially fit uh, a least squares or other type of regression equation and penalize your equation by the magnitudes of the, the coefficients that you have, <coughs> typically by something in the squares. You penalize a regression coefficient <coughs> proportional to its square. And what that does is to shrink the uh, small coefficients towards zero. It leaves the big coefficients where they are and pushes the small ones, not to zero, but to near zero. And then some years ago, I've forgotten when, oh, have I put it down? Yes, 1996. Uh, Rob T. Sharani in, in um, Stanford had this ingenious idea that if you did this system but you penalised your regression not by the sum of squares of the coefficients that you introduced but by the sum of the absolute values, so-called L1 norm, uh, then some of the coefficients, smaller coefficients were actually pushed right to zero, not greatly decreased but still non-zero, but pushed absolutely to zero. And that's because if you penalise a regression by uh, an amount that varies like that, as compared with a, 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 a relation like that, then the very small values are uh, heavily hit. So putting a variable in Tipsharani's formulation, putting a variable into an equation at all, uh, incurred a severe cost, that would be one way of putting it. And Tipurani's method, uh, which he cleverly called the, the lasso, uh, has been quite widely used, particularly in, in some genetic studies recently, where there may be a very large number of explanatory variables, and the lasso can reduce these to a manageable number. Now, my friend and co-worker, Heather Batty from Imperial College, we've been looking at that from a diff slightly different point of view, in which we Tip Sharani's method produces one answer. It says, um, although there are perhaps 10,000 possible explanatory variables, these five fit as well as is possible. Now, there may, there may be a totally different five that fit imperceptibly better, slightly better, but impercep imperceptibly so. Uh, and what Heather and I have aimed to do is to have a method that will find not just one model that fits, but uh, a set of simple models so that we can say 
that the explanation might be this or might be that. Because there's an important point here. If the object of the analysis is just to predict, it is to take the input variables, genetic variables, and predict the outcome, understanding it, it doesn't matter if some other predictor will do equally well. You've got, a, got the best predictor you can. Here it is. Good luck. But what it means is somebody else taking uh, a slightly different set of data, or a very different set of but related data, may perfectly well get a totally and completely different answer that also would have fitted the, pre the first set of data almost as well. So what Heather and I have tried to do, uh, it's too ambitious a job to list all the possible models that fit equally well, but we, we, we end up listing uh, a, num a, a, a modest number, and then it's an interpretive job to say which of these might make sense, which of these is capable of being reproduced. I think, how am I getting on for time? What time do you want me to stop? Uh, Your time. Well, I, I was going to say something about our method, but I don't think I'll do that. I'd move on to something else. No, I'm, I'll move on to something less <laughs> okay. This is now a shift back to general remarks. There are two key ideas uh, connected with the analysis of data. Not, not the only ideas, of course, but two key ones, uh, of which the first is, are the conclusions generalizable? Do we have some, uh, have we found something that's totally specific to the set of data we've been analyzing? Uh, or are we finding something more uh, in some sense, more uh, a broader interest, more generalizable. Um, there's that issue. And then, and this may not concern the fields in which you're working so much, but the opposite extreme of that is specificity. And now, for that, think of a, of a, of a doctor, treat, a clinician treating patients. Here's a patient in front of him or her. And this patient has certain features. And there are two possible things that the doctor may recommend, A or B. Now, there have been, let's suppose, there's been a beautifully organized, randomized trial that has shown that A is significantly better than B. That might say, of a group of patients, 70% uh, do well on A, 30% do well on B. Does that mean that every patient <coughs> does better on A than on B? No. And the qu question facing the clinician is, what is best for my patient? What is the evidence that although A in a randomized trial clearly wins over B, what's the evidence that my patient will do better on A than B? Or in a quite different context, if this policy change is introduced that's been shown in a randomized or essentially in a large study uh, to, to, to be ben on the average beneficial, will it be beneficial in this particular case that I'm interested in? And this is the issue of specificity. And in a certain sense, generalizability and specificity are at opposite ends of the pole. Because generalizability is taking your data outwards into a new f context, where specificity is narrowing it down, uh, not generalizing it, but saying, saying, does it apply here to my particular policy choice or my particular patient? Now, um, I put there the conditions that enable you to make a generalization from a particular study. And I think these are fair, 
I'm, 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 I have to admit I'm thinking primarily of randomised clinical, of, rec, of clinical trials, but I think the, the remarks apply much more broadly than that. Uh, that these are the, the issues. Subject matter understanding, that you understand the psychological, social, uh, biological, physical processes that are going on underneath what you, what you see, so you have some deeper understanding. The size of the effect. Big effects, particularly if expressed as ratios, uh, are much more likely to be stable than small effects. And this was shown in uh, the reference I've given there as to very, uh, it, it was published in 1959 and reprinted in 2009, which is why I've given two dates. Cornfield was, uh, this was a period when, um, surprisingly, Bradford Hill and Dole in London had found that smoking seemed to be a cause of lung cancer. They had expected to find, when they did their study, that air pollution was, which was horrific in London in those days, that air pollution was the cause of lung cancer, but they found that smoking was the cause, seemed to be the, pri the primary cause. And over the next few years, a number of other studies tended to confirm that. But the three leading statisticians of the time were all skeptical. R.A. Fisher considered that um, the effect had a, had a genetic base. As I mentioned previously, that his, he had a primary interest in genetics. He thought that, that uh, what was going on was genetical, which of course has a certain modern uh, nuance to it. Um, Neyman in Berkeley, who, who had been Fisher's friend, but they'd had a long a highly acrimonious and destructive uh, conversation with one another. Um, uh, Neyman also, because it wasn't the study of, it wasn't verified by a randomized trial, he was skeptical. And the leading medical statistician of the time, a clinician called Joseph Berkson, who worked at the Mayo Clinic in somewhere near the center of the United States, Berkson also was skeptical. Uh, because he he made the point that the the, effect, the smoking uh, and lung, uh, effect on lung cancer is the difference between one small effect and a very very small effect. Whereas if you look at the effect of smoking on heart disease, the apparent superficial effect, it's the difference between two big numbers and the the number of people apparently affected. Uh, as a difference of rates uh, was much higher. But now, um, what Cornfield did was to analyze all the work that had been done up to that point. And, he, and it, the essence, I'm not going to go into the details of what he showed, but the his essence of his argument was that there were four totally different lines of argument, all pointing in the same direction. Laboratory studies on animals, laboratory studies on humans, certain types of trial, and, and ultimately clinical trials. And his argument was essentially that while one might be able to explain one of these away, the fact that coming at the problem from four different directions, you got to the same answer, was uh, overwhelming. And he had some more mathematical <laughs> arguments behind it as well, which I won't go into, uh, to do with rates rather than differences, um, ratios of rates rather than differences. Uh, and that really won the day, and Cornfield's uh, paper was accepted by the US, uh, who would it have been, Surgeon General, I suppose, as, as, uh, as, as a definitive statement about the causal relation of smoking and lung cancer. But an essence of that was 
that he was working with, um, the size of the effect was very important. If you can show that you're, what you're looking for is repeatable in many environments, multiple studies with small um, interactions, <coughs> that's another route to a firm conclusion. Uh, in principle, random sampling of your target population gives you the security you want. A security, I might sense, is virtually always lacking. But very few serious studies, certainly on the biomedical side, could possibly be justified as a random sample of the target population. Specificity, I'm not going to say too much about because it it's possibly not of so much interest, but it's to do with the circumstances, as I said, in which the conclusion from some broad study, you can say, yes, this really applies here to my particular uh, decision or policy recommendation or whatever it might be. Uh, and in many ways, the considerations are the same as for generalizability. Now, there's a dreaded word I haven't, I've very carefully, I think, have managed to avoid mentioning, and that's causality. And I think I might decide that I'm beginning to run out of time. <laughs> um, When I started statistical work, causality was a forbidden word. It was philosophy and the, well, serious scientists, mathematicians and physicists didn't have anything to do with that. So I mean, nobody said it quite as blunt as that. But, uh, and then I was going to say quite recently, but it's actually about 30 or 40 years ago, that fairly suddenly changed uh, when uh, um, it was an important paper was read to the Royal Statistical Society in which it was pointed out a massive effort had gone into randomized trials, clinical trials. It was time to turn, to turn attention to issues that could only be addressed observational, by observational methods. And this led to a, cha and a change of emphasis, the formulation of uh, guidelines that would lead to causality and to uh, a massive current literature, uh, some of it coming into the field from the computer science area more than statistics. I'm not going to try and, and discuss that because it's a lecture, more than a lecture on its own and it, by somebody else, not by me. Um, when I say three possible definitions, um, the one that really, the two that really matter are these, that you have evidence that if this had been different from how it is, other things being equal, then the outcome would have been different. Then you can say that the this at the beginning uh, is a cause of the outcome. If you have solid evidence, that had this been different from that, other things been remaining the same, and you have to be very careful what that means, uh, then the outcome would have been different. A third, uh, that's the second definition of causality. The third definition is, the first is that one, plus some understanding of process. Why is this going on? What, what biological, social, or whatever, economic me uh, mechanism is in process that produces the, the change we're talking about. Uh, and so I conclude with what I suppose I have to confess are the limitations of statistical thinking. I try to present, I've, I've said very little about uh, big data machine learning and so forth not to be dismissive about them, but because I want to emphasize the aspects of 
uh, that I see as specifically statistical. Um, the literature is overwhelmingly about probability, probabilistic models. How should they be analyzed and interpreted? Fascinating stuff for those of the mind to, to want to go into that. But it's a tiny proportion of what statisticians do, even theoretical statisticians like, like me. It, it, the formal theory is a fairly uh, important. It's important, obviously, but and it's the intellectual underpinning, but it's it's not what one primarily does. Uh, what it does do is to put an emphasis on trying to get individual studies whose interpretation is as as secure as can be. And that, in a way, is its limitation. Because although it's a good thing, clearly, to have studies that have got secure individual interpretations, nobody can be argued, nobody can not want that. But to see that as the sole objective is too much too narrow. And that very often, the biggest advances come from saying, there's this evidence from here, there's this evidence from there, there's this evidence from there, put those together in some way, then we get an enlightened view. And Cornfield's work that I mentioned a few moments ago, in a sense is an example of that, where he took very, very different types of study. It could, could never have been analysed collectively uh, because they were totally different in nature, different outcomes and so forth. But it's, it was the powerful impact of putting these things all together that made for the strong interpretation. Well, I put some references up uh, for the notes, but not to the... I won't go through them. Well, thank you very much for your attention. Excellent. Thank you very much, David, for these uh, general principles on just how to do research, I think. Uh, not, just, uh, not just statistical research, but any project could benefit from, I think, having the kind of outline that you've presented. Uh, we have time now for some questions. Um, so just raise your hand so that I can bring the microphone to you so that we have the voice recorded as well. Huh. Yes, uh, hi, thank you very much for your lecture. It was uh, very interesting. So I had one question. So there's this one concern that I had, which I discussed with Lydia actually a few days before, which is that I feel like um, an incremental divide between machine learning and statistics. So like machine learning is being developed as it is a separate branch completely independent and now people who are being taught machine learning are not necessarily being taught statistics in this traditional way but only going directly to machine learning and so I wanted to know your thoughts on whether we should be striving for a combination of strategies between statistics and machine learning for analyzing data or is it fine to separate both branches because they're doing different things Well, separation is bound to be a bad idea. Uh, there is a different... Uh, uh, the explanation, I think, comes... Machine learners largely come from an engineering background. The, stati the most tra traditional statistical thinking from a mathematical and, and natural science background. And um, I see machine... Le mach the work on machine learning, I see, uh, it's, some of it's very impressive. And if your object is very short-term prediction in a mechanical fashion, it may well be the best, quickest and safest way to go. Will it lead you to understand the world better? That I'm less convinced about. For the reasons that I explain. I mean, you see, the, the work of Heather's and mine that I went through so hastily at the end. That is kind of machine learning, but, it, but it's, it's focused on trying to say, it might be that, it might be that, it might be that. All these give perfectly good fits to the data. Um, is there extra evidence somewhere that will tell you which is the right one? Or what can we conclude from 
from what we see. Um, and I don't see that spirit I, I, in the machine learning literature. And also, also uh, I mean, some are, Some of the neural te net techniques are very, very clever, but because they're looking for extremely irregular arrange, uh, uh, dependencies in complex systems. Whereas, um, certainly my, my feeling would be to start, start with the simple and make it more complicated if you absolutely have to. So there's a, a difference of philosophy there. I'm, I may be being unfair to me, machine learners, but my impression is if they find a neural net, say, that, that describes a dependency very, very, very nicely, they don't attempt to say why. What does this suggest? What are the weaknesses of this? Will this apply in some new, slightly different situation? They don't seem to... I mean, they must think about this, but I, I'm not trying to be, be uh, difficult. I was just wondering if you could uh, talk a little bit more about the um, issue of causality in the realm of human action and choice because I mean recently I've been thinking a lot that a lot of our model of causality um, are really tailored for you know this sort of exogenous shock that happened to people and I was thinking that I mean in the social world you know people make decisions and have you know some degrees of free wills and I have a lot of troubles uh, bringing really the the sort of causal framework into the social aspect and if i can just give, give an example that i was thinking the other day i'm not entirely sure it's a it's a correct example but i think it um it might touch upon some uh, some of the issues uh, at play so for instance if i shoot felix and kill him i caused felix's death but if nicolo pull a gun in my head and forced me to kill Felix. Who killed Felix? Did I kill Felix? So did Nicolo kill Felix? And I feel that in the social world, we often have this sort of di indirect chain that causes triggers and that it's, it's unclear what cause why and what causing means. Thanks. Well, one, I, I, I share your considerable caution about using the word at all. And even so, there are various levels, because um, if you take causality in the sense, we have reasonable evidence that this group of people, had they been randomized to that treatment rather than this treatment, would have done be on the whole better. Um, we may, it may be possible to get that, and it's not totally unreasonable to say then that this is the treatment, whatever it may be, has caused the outcome. On the other hand, uh, it's certainly not. Um, it's, it's a causal explanation at one level. If you say what was going on in people's minds or what was the biochemistry underlying what they did and so forth, that's another level. And if you pursue that idea, of course, you, everything then goes back to quantum mechanics uh, and your molecules. And if you look at the foundations of quantum mechanics, you find they're a shambles. <laughs> a fantastic, beautiful, extraordinary theory. Great. One of the great intellectual triumphs of the 20th century. But I, I think I'm right still that if you look it doesn't rest on its, science doesn't rest on its foundations, I think is one of the, one of the conclusions. The foundations and the, and the superstructure, so to speak, are mutually supportive. Now in some situations, 
the support is almost all in one direction. But I think it's always an element, the success, why well, one of the reasons the quantum mechanics is so fantastically successful is that it's predicted extraordinary phenomena with high accuracy. Not that it's a, a kind of compelling intellectual structure. Yes, thank you very much for the talk. And uh, I liked especially what you just mentioned, that at some point we seem to hop onto the train, so quantum mechanics all the way in the lowest layer, and then somewhere we just start to track things and we see perhaps predictions or associations. Uh, with that thought in mind, uh, I myself was very mind blown when I first got told that a, a logistic regression uh, works because the error term is an extreme type value one distribution other than a normal distribution, because then the mathematics, there's a mathematical argument. Yeah, yeah. So, so trying to bridge the gap between the machine learning uh, conjecture and the statistics, uh, which is very heavily indebted to assumptions on the error term, I was wondering whether you see uh, potential to retain the standard functional forms we've been using, uh, but to allow new forms of the error terms is so fundamental to the way classical statistics works uh, and what your thoughts are on that because up to some Sorry, degree, what's so fundamental? I'm sorry? You said something is fundamental to how classical statistics work. Well, in the linear regression framework, I would say the normal distribution on the error term. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, I was wondering um, how you see different types of, because obviously every time we do an OLS through our state programming or something like that, we usually assume this normal distribution, um, but obviously we could do different things, mm -hmm. right, now? Yeah. You provisionally assume a normal distribution, you then get your answer, and then you may say, either by subsidiary looking at the data, or in general say, have I made any assumptions in this that might critically affect my answer? And if, the, if you thought, which would be rare, that the answer depended critically on the normality of the errors in a regression, then one would have to do something about it. Quite what, I don't know, but something. Yeah. I mean, it, it's... Uh, and, and like no, no, I, I, I don't see any of these things as uh, stuck in stone, so to speak. Uh, would you see worth to try something like a, a fantastical distribution, which is tri-modal and has... That's kind of the conjecture I was thinking about. This is well, if you found a bimodal distribution, you would surely want to know why. What are, what are, what are the identifiers of... of uh, that, that would be an instance where a, an intermediate stage of analysis may lead you to revise at least some aspects of the question that you started with. And I did emphasize at the beginning that this sequence uh, of stages is a provisional thing. At any point, the worst scenario, the day before your paper is to go, go to a journal, you suddenly say, oh my goodness, I'd better look at that. You'd better look at it. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm sounding, I'm not meaning to sound frivolous about it at all. But these, all the methods, whether they're machine learning or, or driven or um, more formally statistically based, they're all based on, they're all, they all lie on assumptions. Those assumptions may be are likely to be a bit wrong. They may be very wrong. They may be so wrong that they're misleading you. And you have to try and find that in some way or other, discover that and rethink. It's a more flex. I mean, this is the limitation of, of textbooks. Because textbooks, particularly textbooks on statistics, make it sound all so formalized. That's because the mathematicians have got hold of it, you see, and they like 
and, and it, in a way, a very good thing to have very formalized theories. It's not a very good thing to take them too seriously. I take them seriously, but not perhaps too seriously. Do you understand what I mean? Um, thank you, David. It's a pleasure to have the opportunity to, to listen to you. I wonder if you could comment on uh, the recent trend in uh, various strands of social science towards pre-registration, um, something with which I have some sympathy with. But I'm sorry, what was, what was, I, I'm getting a bit deaf. Okay. Uh, uh, the, I, I wonder if you could comment on the, the recent uh, move towards pre-registration in, in, in the social sciences, that is to say, pre-registering the hypotheses that you wish to test uh, and the expectations you have, and whether this goes against any of the principles you, you outlined that have to do with uh, uh, maybe, uh, maybe reassessing your provisional uh, expectations. Well, to be able to say at the beginning of the study, I, I have this purpose in mind, <coughs> and I'm, I'm going to do this and this. That's a good thing. To say after a year or five years or ten years or fifteen years, I'm solely stuck with what I said fifteen, five, however many years ago, is an absolute disaster. <laughs> And a, a travesty, really, of, of what statistical thinking or what scientific thinking really is about. You have to be. So uh, you get the good elements out of these things, but, but uh, pre-registering, I mean, that people putting in for a research grant, I suppose you, you're thinking of primarily, say, what, how how they're going to analyze their data, what possibly they might find. Great, of course they should do this. That they should be totally tied to it, absolutely no. And the longer the time period and the more rapidly involved, evolving the subject, the more disastrous that would be. It's a bit like saying, uh, there's a certain, there's an appalling amount of nonsense being written in the statistical literature about significance tests, which is based on, in my mind, a total misunderstanding of what they're about. But, but we don't want to go into that so much. But the people having to say in advance, this must be significant at such and such a level before I can report my result. So they get P equal 0 0.051 disaster. It hasn't hit the 5% level. And I've, I've actually heard a serious biologist do this, P equal 0.049, hooray, we can publish. <laughs> this is absolute rubbish, of course, total nonsense, total misunderstanding of the purpose of these, of these techniques. Uh, thank, thank you very much. I really enjoyed the talk, and I would be really interested to know what you think about um, the possibility to use non-probability samples to draw conclusions about certain things. So in this summer school, we, for example, uh, heard of um, this opportunity that uh, the internet or the big data provides, that if you're interested in a question that, for example, you don't have data for from a representative survey or maybe a peculiar group of people, then we could easily go on the internet and collect uh, data. Obviously, this wouldn't have the properties of a probabilistic sample that we are used to work with. And then we learned that there is an opportunity to um, sort of weight the data or post stratify and then draw conclusions maybe about the proportion of individuals that would vote one way or another way. Um, but I'm more interested in relationships between variables in the same way as you mentioned, what, how is this thing related to my outcome of interest? So this was a long winded uh, um, Question, but basically my question is, do you think that we would be or will be able to use this kind of non-probability samples to draw similar conclusions as to what we are used to, uh, based well, on regression to. type of uh, analysis? Yeah. Well, what do you think about this in general? Well, probability samples of, of uh, a beautiful, fine idea, uh, if your response rate is well above 95, 98 percent, 
Uh, fantastic. Uh, if your response rate is 40% or 50%, forget it. The probability basis is, is no formal. Uh, you have to use more delicate methods of analysis to detect, well, try and find how is your sample not representative of the, of the target population and make some, does it affect the answer that you're getting? Maybe, maybe not, yeah, that has to be explored. But I, I, I did have it on one of my slides, I was going to say, um, outside certain industrial and physical com contexts in which sampling is done uh, according to strict rules and implemented 100%, uh, in certain kinds of audit, account auditing, for example. An auditor goes to a company, looks at the large number of accounts uh, that, that have to be checked, and he takes a sample of those in accordance with clearly, if he's doing his job properly, with clearly specified sampling rules. That's, that's great. But it's very atypical of most, most research social research situation, as far as I've seen them. You have your data, you have the population that have contributed to the data. What's peculiar about them? How, is there atypicality, something that needs allowance? Maybe not, if you're lucky. So I, I, I don't think the theory of sampling is any help to you once the non-response rate drops below, I'm not going to mention a number, but you know, a number up there somewhere. Uh, take my take some liberties and ask a few of them, if if I may. Um, one of the things that that I thought, so you, you dwelled on this, and I I thought it was very interesting that we have to deal with uncertainty, and think harder about uncertainty in a context where we have big data, but we also have quality concerns, right? So one of the, for example, challenges that we've talked about in the Summer Institute is that often the we have big data sources coming from from uh, from from the internet that that give us a lot of numbers, but at the same time we don't always understand the data generating process because you know they're not they're not custom made for research in the same way that a survey would be, where the researcher has designed the instrument and so on. So in this context of big, but potentially dubious or unclear or black box, um, how do we think about the the measurement of or how do we what are the general principles we can adopt to think about uncertainty because you you commented on how of course standard errors don't work the same way what what do we do then do we do we just use small samples or or should we just a lot of a lot of uh, some people in this room are very interested in moving into the bayesian paradigm to address this uncertainty issue so i'm interested in in hearing your thoughts on how do we think about uncertainty in the context of big and uncertain in, uncertain in the context of quality. Yeah. Um. <laughs> I don't quite know what to say to that. Um. Big data, well, first of all, there may be, it may be possible to say some parts of this data are reasonably secure and others are not. And then one should try and isolate that. Or it may be uh, if the data has come from many sources, that some of the sources are suspect. And there are, there are many things that you might do to check on the quality of the data. Because I, I don't think, in the last analysis, if the data is, mis, is seriously misleading and um, uncorrectable, 
the place for it is the waste paper basket, or the modern equivalent of the waste paper basket, not uh, taking up busy people's time analysing it. But of course, there's a very difficult judgment there as to when, when that, where that threshold is. I don't, I'm, I'm very sceptical of the idea that, that just magic number crunching can correct serious biases in, in data. That's not a very helpful answer, I'm afraid. But um, divide the data into rational sections. Analyze the sections separately. If you find conclusions broadly stable across the sections, that's reassuring. Either you've got a bias that's hitting everything, or there's some stability there. In other words, don't rely, rely on assessments of precision that come directly from the stability of the conclusions across what should be uh, comparable situations, not by internal calculations. The internal, the calculations of precision you'd find in the textbooks that lead to the sigma over root n type of standard error. These are all based on independence of individuals within their groups. And it's probably that it's the most critical aspect and most likely to be wrong. But if you find a meaning, apparently meaningful relation that's stable across different parts of the UK or different countries within Europe or whatever it might be, if there's some external stability in the conclusions, then of course that, that's a, uh, it may, they may all be wrong, but it's much much, that's much less likely. It's not very helpful, but get good quality data is the message. Um, kind of building on that, increasingly a lot of the data that is generated is obviously proprietary to companies. And the way that we create it on outside of the company is mediated by the algorithms that are inside of the company. And so I think at this particular moment, a lot of us are facing the question of whether we stay outside in academia to try and study and deal with the fact that we can't get into the, the black boxes to know what the algorithms are, what the, even just the decisions behind um, the mediation of social life on these online platforms is versus going into the companies themselves and working as scholars there where intellectual freedom is often pointed toward the aims of profitability or, or, or use for the company. There's not as much intellectual freedom, I guess I would say. Um, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, but in the aim of trying to get at the good data, needing to get inside and therefore leave academia. Um, That's rather outside my you don't know <laughs> field, I'm afraid. Uh, the pharmaceutical industry has a peculiar reputation in many ways, but on the whole, it seems to me they have been supportive of good quality research, or at least the, the probably the bigger companies have anyway. And whether that's a, a model of how it might proceed, because it's a, other than the research councils, to mount a clinical trial of the size that's now thought necessary to get pretty clear results requires a massive resource, both of time and, uh, I mean, my only, uh, my only experience with that is working for 10 years with, uh, on the management committee of a trial run by a pharmaceutical industry. And I would say that their treatments of the problem seem to be scrupulously honest to me. I think 
he, he said you made it's outside of your area to answer, but that's actually a very interesting answer. I don't think I was thinking in the direction of pharmaceuticals, but more in the social media platforms. And but the the answer it, it provides a, a question for all of us in terms of whether the the more social media platforms need to take as seriously, given the impact that they can have on society, need to take the sciences the science more seriously in the way that pharmaceutical companies have to run trials on their drugs to see the effect. Um, so anyways, I did, the answer was still thought provoking, so thank you. So I'm gonna ask another one then, because I, uh, I'm interested, so I, an interesting theme that I thought throughout your talk was sort of, there was implicitly this kind of dichotomy or tension between prediction and explanation. Um, and and this is a recurring theme also, both in the Summer Institute, but also in the context of wider discussions about statistics versus machine learning. Um, and and I'm, I'm sort of, I find this a bit sometimes misleading to dichotomize in this way, because I do think that the purpose of a lot of theorizing is implicitly also prediction. Um, and so I, I don't think that it's as sort of separate in the way that often it is made out to be in, in this um, in the machine learning versus sort of classical theoretical or domain specific paradigms, um, and and I wondered what what you thought about this this difference this the explanation versus prediction distinction that is being made and and whether you think that um, it maps as as neatly onto the sort of statistics machine learning um, divide as well. No, that's a very, very important question. And um, I think my reaction would be prediction without understanding is a perilous business. Uh, you may get a beautiful prediction formula uh, that applies in the very, very short term or in this particular context. Uh, but unless you understand uh, unless either you've shown the essential stability of this prediction formula over quite a range, wide range of conditions, or you understand the sociology or the physics or whatever might be behind the formula, it's perilous for predicting the future. And this is, seems to me, the trouble with much short-term economic forecasting people can get very sometimes very good short-term predictions but then the prediction model changes so i think even if well the two lines one can take one can say really as academics our, our object is to understand the world hopefully make it a better place if we can in this, some sort of way. Uh, if you take the other view and say our object is to produce um, good prediction, how do you produce good prediction? Well, in the longer term, by understanding, not purely by empirical fitting. I think. I hope. So, so would you then say that the that uh, uh, the, the machine learning paradigm is then intrinsically geared only for the short term? On the face of it, I mean, I wouldn't want to accuse. I'm, I'm sure there are people in the machine learning field who are more broader and more subtle in their thinking than that, but. The machine learning, as I feel, as I look at it from the outside, does seem very, very focused on fitting this particular set of data, uh, even by highly contrived uh, methods, but successful methods. And you see, this relates to the, the discussion that I, I glossed over of the distinction between Tibshulani's 
very influential work on the lasso, which was empirical prediction. He wasn't concerned to say, ah, oh, here's, here's a formula that predicts beautifully. Here's a different formula that does almost the same job with a total different interpretation. I mean, I haven't discussed it with him personally, but, uh, but I don't sense in his writing any effort to do that. And I may be being unfair to him compared with trying to say, yes, we can predict, here's a predictor, but there are alternative explanations that uh, are, as it turns out in the example that Heather and I looked at, some of the features were remarkably stable. We had a num we ended up with a number of prediction equations that fitted virtually identically well. But there was a substantial common element to them, so we could say, well, whatever the final prediction we use, we better have this, this, and this in there. And that's a stable, that's an element of stability that seems to me important. So you would say that you see your work with, with Heather Batty as, as in response to trying to, in some sense, bridge this prediction explanation, because you're, you're the way I understand that paper is that it's also in some sense trying to see, to trying to let the the domain expert adjudicate between different models to see what might be a plausible uh, story to tell. But so do you, do you see that paper as, as trying to say that we shouldn't necessarily be thinking of prediction and explanation as, as separate goals? Well, I'm always... I think, been primarily interested in explanation and regarded prediction as interesting side issue to that. Important, but, but not, not the prime goal. How the work with Heather started, I, how does work start? I don't know. <laughs> it's all, it, it started all those years ago. It started no, it's three years ago. Three years ago. It's a, that's the remote past. <laughs> I just wanted to ask you if you think that there should be, because I don't, I'm not sure I have seen this, maybe you know of this, but do you think um, there's a field which should move on the intersection between machine learning and classical statistics? So let's generate more strategies on combining both. So for example, using predictions from machine learning algorithms in more inferential statistics, or just generating sort of like hybrid models that takes the, both the best of both worlds? Well, I, I, I don't quite see it like that. I think we all have to do the best we can. We all have to do, be as broad as we can and recognize the people in related fields to ours are doing similar things, we're interested in that and helpful, and so forth. I, I regard the division, I, in 10 years' time, uh, or 20 years' time, people, what's the difference? There may be no difference. I, I, I don't think these, at the moment, the differences are quite strong, and in fact, in Oxford, particularly strong, because the machine learning side of statistics in the statistics department is much bigger than the statistics department. Statistics part. But that's an accident of time. <laughs> I, I, these things, uh, uh, the emphasis within big, statistics is a very broad field, ranging from the very, very, very mathematical uh, to the purely descriptive and subject matter, purely subject matter based. And interests in it, have evolved, even over my lifetime, they've evolved and changed some, some periods. This is focus of most interest, sometimes that. A sign of life. Um, if we don't have any further questions, 
Do we, okay, we have one more. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much for this very nice talk. Uh, I'm, it's basically actually a follow up of what Ridi was asking a bit, uh, but I would like to not so much focus on the distinction between explanation and prediction or the, the, the uh, computational field and statistics, but maybe what do you, how do you think your general rules extend to the computational world? So for example, is parsimoniousness of models still so important or actually not anymore? Uh, because they only serve us better comprehend the models or something. Uh, how is it still, how important is it still to um, be super explicit about your uncertainty if you just, all you look for is like the best model. So you have very general, uh, very nice uh, goals for statistics. How, where do you see the commonalities to, uh, to the new world? <laughs> oh, that's a very difficult question. Um, the brutal answers. I don't. I never think about. I. I just like. I guess so many working scientists, one presses on and tries to do something a bit useful, but <laughs> thinking about these general issues is is fantastic, and that's why it's so good to come and talk to you, hear hear what you have to say about these things. Um, The, point, the important out of out of diversity comes strength. Somebody must have said that, and and the statistical world has changed enormously in my lifetime. It's very different in different countries. In Western Europe, it's much more mathematical than it is here. Most British statisticians have a strong interest in one or more fields of application. That's not always the case, and it's certainly not the case in the United States, for example. So there are, diff there are national differences of emphasis and style as between uh, very basic principles, applying those principles to complicated problems, being involved in real applications, and so on. And these all feed one another. That's a terribly useless answer, but I, I don't, I, I can't give a better one, I'm afraid. All right, I think uh, that takes us to lunchtime. I want to thank David once again for a very thought-provoking talk um, and for his comments on, I think, a wide range of, of issues that we've been discussing throughout the Summer Institute. Um, so yes, thank you, David. Thank you.